right, so tonight we've been doing a, a how-to series. I'm excited just getting in the Word of God and sharing it. Those of you coming into the garage through YouTube, welcome. We appreciate it. I hope you got something to take notes. I hope you got your Bibles handy. So this series is designed, I, the Holy Spirit spoke to me in, uh, some time ago, and he designed this series to give Christians the how-to's. In other words, what to do, when to do it. I think Christians today would be a whole lot more um, victorious if they knew what to do or when to do, to do it, right? I listen to a lot of good Christians, and they still think that they pray to God and ask God to bind the devil. When the scripture actually says, you bind the devil in my name. So sometimes we get something all kind of crazy and of course, what I've been sharing with some of the people earlier is that remember, when we approach God within our own strength, what happens? God has to reject Cain. And he opens to Abel, our spirit. Can you say amen? So if we approach God, we pray, we do anything out of the energy, what I call the energy of the flesh, then what happens is it amounts to nothing. It's wood, hay, and stubble. All right. So if you'll take your Bible and go with me to Luke chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 1. We're going to learn tonight how to pray effectively. Now I'm going to share some things that might not be in my notes, but it will be applicable to what we learned tonight. You go to Hebrews, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. So I love to search the scripture. What did Jesus say? Search the scripture for in him you'll find me. You know what I mean? So when we look at scripture, we don't look to get rebuked. We don't look to rebuke maybe somebody that we know needs to be straightened up. No, we look for Jesus in all the scripture that we search and we learn to apply the scripture to our own life. All right, Luke 11 verse 1. Listen to what it says. Now it came to pass... As he was praying in a certain place. Where was Jesus praying? Yeah, we're going to get to a, a place is sometimes important. Not always, because prayer is the most important thing. But certain things happen. Jesus had a certain place. He had certain areas that he prayed. Now, I'm not emphasizing the place so much as the consistency of prayer. And he said, okay, he was praying in, a certain pla praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray as John also taught his disciples. Now here's a strange thing. John taught his disciples, but John was under the Old Testament. So there was no using in the name of Jesus. Jesus was there to bridge the Old Testament with the New Testament and to finish a covenant and set us up. So then in the day after Jesus' resurrection, he says, in that day, you shall ask me nothing. But whatever you ask the Father in my name. In other words, we have to go through Jesus to get the New Testament results that he promised. I hear a lot of people teaching back, back in the olden days about Daniel, how he fasted and he prayed for 21 days. And it said that when the angel showed up with the answer, he says, the moment you began to pray, God heard you. But it took me 21 days to battle the prince of Persia to get the prayer answered. Now, aren't you glad we're in the New Testament, not the Old Testament? So when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, boom, you're already through. Yes. You're already through. Because there's no other name given in heaven where amongst men we can be saved. You know, the things in heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth, there's no name comparable with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall what? So when we pray to the Father in Jesus' name, we're bulwarking right against the, the one who's dwelling in the clouds and in the atmosphere, the prince of power of the air. Okay? So as we use the name of Jesus, he has to move aside. Amen. But notice that Jesus had a certain place he prayed. You know, Mount of Olives, the garden, many places he prayed. Now, I can relate 
to you just a minute. Back when we were in Buckley as a church, we, our church was up in Buckley. Now, a unique thing about that is we were in a Masonic Lodge, a Mason Hall. So we would have to go into the Mason Hall and bind up all the spirits because they'd meet once a week and we would meet on Sundays. we bind that all up and we would pray in the place. And we'd walk through and we'd pray and we'd take authority and we'd cover a couple of uh, some cultic signs like an upside down star and a few things like that. And then we would pace back and forth at the altar and just plead the blood and pray and ask for people to come. Now, why am I saying that? That was a place that many people used a lot to pray over and over again. I can think it's just like the Western Wall or what years ago they used to call the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. Now they call it the Rejoicing Wall because all those thousands of years of prayer caused something to happen. So the place to prayer, a consistent place to prayer is very good too. But we know prayer is the key thing. And so what happened? Well, I can tell you one time that you could go up to the up at temple and on any given day and stand there and your whole knees would get weak and you'd shake because of the consistent prayer that went out. We really want that for our life, to be consistent in our prayer first thing in the morning with God so that our life vibrates with God's presence. And the enemy can't quite con us as easily sometimes as he normally could. Can I have an amen? All right. So I remember down in my church back in Pacific in Algona, we used to pray up front too. And as we did, we'd gather in a circle and we prayed. We'd give everybody a chance to pray for revival, pray for new faces to come, and really start really praying up, lifting hands and praising. Well, they got a couple of pictures of us that while we were praying, they caught it on film where the Holy Spirit, you could see the Holy Spirit working all around, caught on film. Now, I haven't been able to find that picture, but I know I got it stored in my, my archive somewhere. But it, it, unbeknownst to us, we're praying. Somebody was just taking pictures of the church in different areas, and boom. So prayer is very, very important. It's one of the greatest expressions of a caring, loving Christian to pray for others who might not be able to pray for themselves, all right? First Timothy chapter 2, 1 through 4, tells us who to pray for. It says, therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, in the King James, excuse me, I got the hiccups. In the King James, the word supplication means to petition the Lord. It simply means to say, Lord, your word says, and I believe I receive it. Your word says it, so therefore I believe I receive it. Therefore, I already thank you for it. And as far as I'm concerned, it's on its way. You see how that's done? I'm doing it for the camera too, so you understand. So first of all, supplications, petitionings, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made known for all, be given for all men. One person a long time ago says, uh, do we pray for sinners? Yes. Especially pray for your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully hate you. You know, people that can't even get themselves to church. Pray for them. Why? Because prayer is an expression of love asking God to come on in in behalf of someone else. How's your prayer life? Let me encourage you to do that. Are you still with me? He says now, it says, be made for all men, for kings, for presidents, for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God and our Savior, who desires that all men be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So guess what? God wants everybody to be saved. I think a lot of Christians forget that good old Baptist, you know, the track in the hand and, and ask people to say, hey, is that seat saved? And then they go, well, no. He says, are you? We need to keep reaching out to others and not assume. I like to ask people, when was your moment of epiphany when you accepted Jesus Christ? When was that changing moment? And if they can't tell me when that defining moment is, we need to make sure they can yeah. by getting them born again. See, they may assume they're okay. Remember? 
What did we say? The knowledge of good and evil, good, fleshly good, and evil, fleshly evil. So good people can be good in their own natural person, but it's not good enough to touch God. So you could build a hospital, you know, for the glory of God in your name, and then not mount to anything before God. That's scary. So a prayer warrior... When he starts praying, a person that loves to pray for others, they're getting tons of reward. Why? Because it's self-sacrificial to spend time for praying for others and study yourself all the time. Well, moving right along. And this is not only that, but he wants all men to be saved. Now, first point, we need to have a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. So we need to have a pure heart of prayer. You just say, well, are you talking about real holiness? No, I'm talking about a sincere heart when you pray. When you hear people pray, sometimes they're nervous. So they pray off the top of their head. Thank you, God. And they're almost like they're trying to impress everything and not try to stumble over words. God doesn't want prayer like that. He wants you to rather go, God, I need help, please. Thank you so much, God. Sincere prayer where it's coming right out of the core of your gut, not off the top of your head. God doesn't know much here in our head because there's not much here to know. Hello, even though we, we know a lot and some things, we can approach God intellectually. It's kind of boring for him, don't you think? Let's move past that. All right, so pure in heart, prayer, sincere you know, our heart, first off, when I pray, I want to make sure my heart's adoring God. I, I'm not sitting there going, you know, oh God, you know, fix them and uh, straighten this out. And by the way, fix me too. No, I start adoring God so that God, I can feel when I get into sync. Shlink. I'm into sync. And I said, Lord, just cleanse me and wash me, massage my spirit as I begin to share with you. First of all, I need to acknowledge that I'm weak. Okay, I need your help, you see, because when you approach God on the fact that you got it together, you see, you're going to have a hard time of prayer. It just doesn't work that way. God is a spirit, and he wants to hear from your spirit, not from your head. Well, I don't know quite to pray. Hey, have you ever had a good cry time, blubber, saline solution all over your face because you're blubbering? Great. Keep it up. That's how you get exercised in the realm of the spirit. Now, you don't always pray that way. There's serious prayer. I've found 23 different styles or different positions in a prayer. Prayer of agreement, prayer of faith, and all these different kinds of prayer. They're expressed sometimes all in the same setting through somebody that's praying. But at the same time, we need to understand that the heartfelt prayer of a believer, of a righteous man, or woman, is avails and accomplishes a lot. I had a friend, her name was Beulah. She's since gone on to be with the Lord. But God had laid out on her heart that she would be my personal intercessor. She says, I don't care how honorary you are, Pastor Kerry, I'm going to spend every day praying for you. And I'm, the first thought I had is, oh, I must really need some help. You know, it's just real secu secure, you know. But no, she did. Kept praying for me, kept praying for me, and she'd get a word from God, and she would meet with me and says, As God, what's God been telling you? It was great. I think that's died away in a lot of churches today. Why aren't we praying for one another? Why aren't we talking seriously about prayer? Seriously about the word? It's not so much the pastor. Well, our pastor, he has to talk about that stuff. He's the pastor. Well, how come the people aren't talking about it as much as they should? Then you get somebody kind of makes an excuse, and if you're not careful, you'll start agreeing with them, and they'll, you'll strengthen their backsliding. So when you're talking with somebody, somebody's making all kinds of excuse about not going to church and stuff, you be careful what you agree with. Just be careful. And so, because you're going to go and visit God in prayer and ask God to change their thinking. And remember, when you're asking God to change somebody else's thinking and actions, pray that God change yours too. All right. Are you with me? First Peter 3.12 tells us. 
Okay, this. Okay, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. The Amplified says, always open to their prayers. So God's always listening for a sincere prayer. I mean, you be praying in and out all day long. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Emo. Okay, now let's go back to the evil thing that I was sharing with you earlier. It says, you be, how many of you being evil can give good gifts to your children? What is he talking about? You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, the nature of evil and the nature of flesh trying to be good works entered in, okay? And Jesus addresses his disciples and he says, you being evil, you can give good gifts. You can be a good person, but you got an evil nature in your flesh. So don't feed the evil nature in your flesh. And we find out that Paul, the apostle Paul, struggled with it from Romans chapter 6 all the way to Romans through Romans chapter 8. He deals with the flesh part of him. And even though he was a righteous Pharisee, he was doing everything that he could do right, he found that that evil presence, that fallen nature of Adam, was working in his flesh. So even when he was good, he was bad at it. <laughs> You could tell somebody the gospel and you can do it in such a way they fell three inches tall to a grasshopper. <laughs> Beat them up with a word, you know. No. Anyway, so prayer is simply communication with God. It's to be done in Jesus' name. We're New Testament Christians. Out of a pure or sincere heart. Prayer is an act of love to God on the behalf of others. As we offer our prayer, we should also wash and make sure our hands and our heart is clean. Making sure our motives are right and making sure we've made a little bit of adjustment so that we're in tune with the one in whom we are praying to. Amen. So Mark 11, 25 and 26 says, And whenever you stand praying, Uh-oh, do we have to stand praying? No. Remember the scripture saying, having done all to stand, stand. Really what it is, is when you pray, you have to make a God stand. Yes. You have to make a word stand. You have to stand on the foundation. His name is God, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, yes. the Holy Spirit. You have to make a stand. So therefore, when you stand or you make a solid confrontation and petition before God, See, I never got that before. See, we all thought of somebody standing up and offering a prayer. No, not only that. That it's included. But when you make a stand praying, it's serious to you, right? I mean, if something's happening to your child, you're going to make it stand and pray, and you're serious with God. I don't see a whole lot of that nowadays. Everybody, no, I'm not trying to, just not trying to make us feel bad. It just seems like maybe we should go to God and say, Lord, how would you like me to make adjustments in that realm? I'd rather have him share with me some of the areas that I can make adjustments and he will help me make them and do it even better than the way I've been doing it for years. Can you say amen? Yeah. All right, so when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, Forgive them. Why? It's pretty simple. We don't really need to explain. But there are people who are mad at somebody so they don't pray for them. Or when they do pray for them, can you imagine this? God straightened them up. They're just really a, a mess. Don't ever pray for people like that. First of all, God doesn't accept any of that prayer. But it's flesh prayer. So who could pick up on that kind of prayer? The boogaloo. Mr. Split Toe. So don't pray curses down on people. Don't pray rebukes down on people. You know? Don't do that. Because as you sow, so shall you also reap. Even Michael the archangel just turned to Satan. He said, the Lord rebukes you. When we rebuke the enemy, 
You just turn to him and say, Jesus Christ beats you and he rebukes you and I stand with him. Hello? We stand with him. All right, so you're still with me here. So check this out. Psalms, I love what this says. Psalms 66 verse 18. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So the idea, what does that mean? Well, how many here, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you had iniquity in your heart? But you weren't regarding it to hide it from God. God, you were confessing it. So when a, Christ, when a person comes to God for the first time, he comes as a sinner, not to a high priest, but to the king of kings. And he must bow his knee and confess Jesus as Lord. Then after that, as Christians, now listen to me carefully. As Christians, we don't longer go to Jesus as sinners. We come to him as our high priest and as children of God. So he looks as, a, yes, we do make mistakes and we do have the nature of sin in our members. We're not to yield them to unrighteousness. But God doesn't look at as condemning us to hell. He looks at us and we really got a problem and we need to come to him about it. Because you will keep that problem all through your life if you don't ask God to help you with it. We call that being in denial. So moving past that, prayer is an absolute great time to get softened and not regard things. So we don't want to regard odd against somebody. We don't want to choose the church up the street against the church down the street. All that is foolish, childlike stuff. Can I have an amen? amen. All right, so we can't regard iniquity in our heart. I got a couple of points under that. Prayer is the lock at night and the door to our day. What do you mean? When you go to sleep at night, if you're, with, you're married or if you're not married, just take a little time out to meet with Jesus. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I just lock the door tonight. My dreams will be sweet. My attitude will be sweet in the morning. Wake me up, Lord. Let there be no complications. I just kind of worship and thank you that right now in Jesus' name, I plead the blood of Jesus over in my dreams. And you put a lock on your subconscious mind where God stands and watches over you. This is where we get some of these songs where Christ sings over us and God loves over us. Why? Because prayer at night is a lock. Satan dwells in the darkness. Okay, so cut him out. Now in the morning when you meet with God first thing, it's the unlocking of the door for the day. Lord, I'm excited. You and me today, Lord. So please shut down my flesh and my stinking thinking. Lord, I worship you. I thank you, Lord. And then he begins to work. He rises up, begins to fill you, begins to give you good thoughts. Suddenly you find all of those things that kind of stressed you out all going away. And just press on a little further and just love on the Lord a little further. Then he tunes you in, tunes you up, adjusts your spirit, your soul, shuts down your flesh so it doesn't rebel throughout the day and helps you to keep your mind off yourself. That's why I like to meet with God first thing in the morning. Amen. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I make plenty of mistakes. Yes, but the mistakes that I make, I shouldn't keep repeating them. We should be all changing, right? But who's the one who brings us change? Ourself? Our want to? No, God in our hearts. But we have to go to him, and then we have to get out of the way so he can change us. All right, moving past this. Secondly, prayer is the invitation to the supernatural for God to come in and intervene. It's a door into the realm of God. Many failures come not because they don't pray. It's because they forget to pray. We have not because we ask not. Yeah. And so I asked my pastor years ago, I said, how come I'm not getting the victory that I see a lot of these older Christians? And he says, because they spend a little more time in prayer probably than you think is necessary. And he says, God's grace is sufficient for us and he will carry you through. Even if you just get saved at a Billy Graham's thing and you still love Jesus, you'll be saved. No rewards, but you'll be saved. He says, if you really want to get in and find out the heart of God and the will of God for your life, you have to be 
in prayer long enough for God to reveal it to us. Come on. Paul talks about a time where the scales came off his eyes. He said he heard the gospel for the first time from the Spirit of God and not out of religious traditions of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the religious Jewish people of the day. We want to get our understanding of Scripture from the Bible, but with the help of the Holy Spirit to give us revelation. Same when we go into prayer. We need the whole help of the Holy Spirit to help us to pray correctly. Can you say amen? And I'm not just talking about praying in the Spirit, but I'm also talking about having a spiritual mindedness in our prayer. You know? And so we do that. So thirdly, prayer is a must. It's not an option. It says when you pray. Didn't say if you pray. Right? All right. My next point is prayer. We need to pray the word or at least in line with the word. Can you say amen? Well, one of the things that helps us with that is understanding that the word is God and God is the word. You can't separate them. We separate the word in the Old Testament because it's under a different dispensation and covenant. But it's the same God. But we move it over into the New Testament where God comes now and dwells in a believer. Old Testament, God was with the believer. In the New Testament, God dwells in the believer. So therefore, how God treats us now is one of his own because we have his mark and we have his spirit. Can you say amen? So we have to begin to think the way God has designed for us to think. And we can't drag the old man in and analyze our present day from all our past experiences. Because not everything we experienced in the past was a positive. Can you say amen? So we don't want to analyze the present with just past things. We want to analyze the present in the presence of God and in the word and ask God for instructions. So we continue to grow out. God loves us so much that he accepts us who we are. But he loves us so much to not leave us that way. You should be changing every month. There should be noticeable changes. Maybe the way you talk. Maybe the way you accept things. Maybe the way you get after it. There be, should be changes and ask God to show those changes to us so that we can understand we are growing. We're just not existing. Moving right along. All right, so John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was, was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. So we need to pray the word. God can't say no to himself. So when you say, God, your word says, he says, yeah, yeah. He says, when you say, Father, I believe it in Jesus' name and I trust that you'll bring it to pass. Now he says, now you please me. Because God, whether you know it or not, loves to show himself strong. He loves to prove himself to those who cry out for him. He loves to reveal himself in situations where it looks like no hope, where you ask God to come in and intervene, and he stands up and says, here am I. This is our God, but it comes through those people who pray and are with him and understand how he works and functions. Like I was sharing earlier before recording this, that every effort that we do, that's a good effort if we don't do it because God wants us to do it or do it to bless God, then it's going to amount to nothing. You could make the prettiest garden in the world and you did it all for your recognition and you did it all just to be noticed. That garden is not worth a thing to God. What he'd rather have you do is give a glass of water in love to somebody. That reward will last forever. And that's why, again, Jesus said, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Haven't we done this? Haven't we done this in your name? Haven't we done this in there? Haven't he says, Depart from me, workers of iniquity. Why were there workers of iniquity? Weren't they doing good things? Let me ask you, wasn't Cain doing a good thing by offering his garden to God? No. It says he he did evil. Now, how do you explain that, Pastor Kerry? Because satanic nature was in Cain, and he did it the way 
that satanic nature told them to do it, even though it was good, because I'm sure the vegetables were very impressive. But God can't eat from a cursed work. No matter how good it is, he has to energize and he feeds off the energy of our spirit. Let me ask you, iniquity, do you find that in your spirit? No, it's your flesh. You're born again. Do you find anger in your spirit? No. God's in your spirit. You find anger in your flesh. Resentment, bitterness. You find that in your flesh. And if you let it leak in, it will affect your prayers. Paul writes, he says, don't let a root of bitterness spring up. Whereby when you talk to others, everybody can hear you're bitter. Hello? Whew, I done preached myself happy. Welcome to Bible study. We're learning a lot, aren't we? Amen. All right, so let's go on here. Never inform God. A couple, couple points underneath John 1.1. 1, 1, pray the word or at least in line with it. Point one is never inform God or pray the problem. Why? God already knows. Amen. But why do people do that? Oh, Lord, you don't know what I'm going through. Oh, I'm really this way. I actually did that. I mean, God interrupted me. I've shared this story many times. Carrie, what are you doing? Lord, you know I'm praying. Then he asked me again. I felt like Peter. Carrie, what are you doing? I'm praying. He says, no, you're not. You're complaining. He says, nothing gets done with complaining. Look at the Israelites. All they did is get bit by snakes. Number two, remember God needs invitation. You didn't get God in your heart until you what? Invited him in. I stand at the door and knock. What are you to do? Open the door and invite him in. And then make him feel so welcome he stays. A lot of Christians today, they, they welcome him in and then they act out in the flesh and he's still in, but he's stuck in the closet somewhere but while they run out their own selfish life. I'm done preaching to us, okay? So remember, God needs invitation. We have not because we what? There we go. We got it. These principles are over and over and over all throughout scripture. It's kind of cool. Third thing is, for God... To answer, he needs faith and his word. He can't answer your wishes. Boy, I wish I had this, and boy, I wish I had that. No, no, please don't. I'm not picking on anybody. I don't know if you do the wish thing or not. I wish, I wish, I wish. I wish this would happen. I wish that would. There's no faith in wishing. It's only a dial of expectancy. And if you're not careful, you're wishing I wish I can get, stop doing the stupid things that I'm doing. I wish, I wish, you see. It's intellectual. Wishing comes out of the soul while faith comes out of the spirit with God in it. Can you say amen? That's the difference. So for God to answer, he needs faith and he needs to answer in agreement with his word at least. Fourthly, do you own a pocket promise book? Take it with you in your prayer. Ephesians 6, 17 through 19 says, And take the helmet of salvation, get your mind correct, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Sword of the, notice the Spirit there is capital S. Yeah. So the sword that the Holy Spirit uses is the word of God. Yeah. And if you're not filled with the word of God, you're going to go open your mouth and it's going to fall to the ground. Spirit's got to come out like a sword. Yes. Amen. If you've got a real ugly looking devil staring at you, wouldn't you want to be able to poke and cut his head off? You do it with the word. Yes. <clears throat> okay, I think you got it. Okay, it says taking the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always. Amen. I like to reverse those, always praying. With all manner of prayer and supplication, there's petitioning, in the spirit. You see the thing there? Not in the intellect. In the spirit. 
So when you approach God sincerely and gut felt sincerity, you got God's ear all the time. So don't try to impress God with some old God of you know of. Or Lord, we like that. Amen. Stop that. It's insulting to God and those who know how to pray. So I'm not talking to you. That's not, none of you doing that. You see how we can be, oh, he's talking to me. No. I'm saying don't pray off the top of your head. Get into your gut and really tell God how you feel and what the word says about it. That might take a little study before you enter in and maturely talk with God. Moving right along. Hebrews, I love what Hebrews 4.12 says. It says, for the word of God is living. So when we pray the word of God, it's what? It's living. And not only is it a sword of the spirit, but it's a living sword of the spirit. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even the division between soul and spirit. You can tell what's your attitude of your mind and what's really coming out of your gut, your spirit. Of the joints and the marrow. Joints couple and marrow produce life. Joints couple bones. And it is a discerner of your thoughts and your intents of your heart. People that pray a lot, they don't waste words. You don't see them running around making cracking jokes and acting dumb. People that pray a lot are people of few words. Most of them that I know pray a lot, they know their words are very, very important. They calculate them. They use them as painting portraits with their prayer. And their words become few. Be slow to, yeah, quick to hear, slow to speak, so you don't get angry. Right? And slow to anger. Amen. So let's go on. So, Again, from your spirit. So my next point is make time and a place to pray and be consistent. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, I realize that you can pray in and out throughout the day, and, and I encourage you to do it. But you see, nowadays, it calls for a time and a place. It really does. Everywhere we read, where the Bible says over in Matthew, when you pray, go into your closet, close the door, and pray to your Father who's in the secret place. And God who sees you in the secret place will reward you openly. People that pray are always getting blessed, even if they're silly. This lady, Beulah, that prayed for me all the time, I mean, blessings would just stick like putty on her. She couldn't even get rid of them half of them. It just tick, 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 tick. What was causing it? The favor and the power of God resident in a prayer warrior, somebody that loves to pray effectively, to pray accurately. Amen? So there isn't, what I'm trying to tell you is this is one of the first lessons I learned from my pastor. If you can't spend quality time every day in prayer, you're never going to go very far unless you stumble on something. And then you've got to pursue God. Seek ye first. You've got to pursue God. You've got to pursue, pursue, keep pursuing. Don't stop and think you're arrived. No, no, no. Okay. So my next point is make time and a place for God. Matthew 6, 5 through 13 tells us we're going to go through the Lord's Prayer, but I'm going to do it in a different way. When we talk about the Lord's Prayer, really it is a prayer of what to cover when you are in prayer with God. That it's actually a template or a model of what to cover. Now, also what's missing in this prayer is this prayer was given to his disciples before he died and rose again. So this is Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, this will cover the same thing, but you use it in Jesus' name. So it says, but when you pray, not if, go into your room, time and place. And when you have shut your door, shut everything out, pray to your father in the secret place. And your father who sees in the secret place will reward you openly before everybody. Don't reward yourself, let God reward you. Seven, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions 
Oh, please, 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 God. Oh, God, we got me, we got me. Please, 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 please. I'm so unworthy. God, we got me. I'm just hamming it up so you get an idea. I certainly hope you'll help me, God. You know, I'm, I'm making faces of it because it's so putrefied at times when we start faking like that. That's just a fake. What's real is I'm broken, God, and man, I feel like my heart's going to jump out of my chest. I need help. Bing. <laughs> Instead of intellectually trying to Crashing yourself into the, just get with it. Can you say amen? All right. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want you mad at me. So let's move on. So it says, for they think by their multitude of speak in many words that they're heard. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things that you have need of before you ask. So what does he say? So don't bother asking. So ask that you may what? Receive, seek, and you shall knock, and the door shall be. Amen. So now we get it. So he goes, and so I, I put some expertise. Uh, do you have the scripture, or is it printed out in your notes? Is it printed out? You see the red things? These are some of the emphasis, what he's really emphasizing. So it says, our Father in heaven. First thing, if you want power, you have to acknowledge where the power lies. It doesn't lie in yourself. It doesn't lie in your wisdom. It lies in our Father, which is in heaven. You got to make the connection. In the New Testament, our Father, which is in heaven, in Jesus' name. Bing! Hallowed be your name. God, I honor you. I believe you're perfect. I worship you. I make you far greater in my life than myself or anything else. You're hallowed, Lord. Say that before you start praying. And really mean it sincerely. Thirdly, your kingdom come. Now, there's three kingdoms in the earth. There's a kingdom of God that's over all things. There's a kingdom of heaven that came at Pentecost. Came, brought the heavenly things to the believer. That's called the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of God is the big one. Kingdom of heaven is a temporal one that came at Pentecost because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And the kingdom of darkness. Each kingdom means it's a place of dominion and power. So the kingdom of God is God's all dominion. In all, through all, and in you all. And then the kingdom of heaven, temporal kingdom, is the one that comes giving us the supplies from heaven. It's kind of God's shooting a supply system via the Holy Spirit. And anytime you need anything from God, this kingdom is hidden from darkness and revealed to a believer who searches for it through the scripture. And then the kingdom of darkness is Satan's domain yes. where he deceives and he lies, where he has the sicknesses and the disease, all of these things, and he's trying to get our attention to pay more attention to him and what he's doing than what God is doing. And the way that we beat that is meet with God and learn to pray. Yes. Woo! It's getting foggy in here. Then he says, your kingdom come, your provision, your ultimate dominion, your will be done. God's purpose and plan. What is God's will? Well, Look at heaven. God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is there any limits in heaven? No. So guess what? God's plan is for you to not be limited in your own abilities, but rather through prayer and through obeying God, you take on God's attributes and God's abilities. Yes. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. Bread stands for Jesus, stands for provision. In the New Testament, it says that God shall supply all of our need according to his riches and glory. Amen. So there you go. One of the names for God is El Shaddai, the all-supplying one, the all-sufficient and supplying one. God doesn't have any limit. Okay? And he says, give us this day our daily supplies and forgive us our debts. 
One thing when you're praying, God, forgive me. If there's something that's in the way, if I'm in the way, forgive me, Lord. Really forgive me. And begin to point out areas that I can give to you so you can work. Just make sure you cover that. Why? Because you have an accuser. And he will accuse you if you have any odd at all. You know where the Bible says, judge not lest you be judged, right? And then he says, why behold the specks in your brother's eye? You know, some people have messed up so much. If we're not careful, that's all we can see in them. God doesn't want us to look at other people as mess ups. In fact, this side of heaven, I think we're all mess ups. Can you say amen? So he doesn't want us focusing. But if we're not careful and not a person of prayer and not keeping with God, we can actually hold little things against people and not even know we're doing it. I have people that, oh, you can't listen to that guy. I don't like the way he teaches. How dare you say that about somebody? You might not, but don't spread it to somebody else. You see? We do that, and we wonder why there's no power in our lives. Because we get filled up with God the first thing in the morning, we spew all the rest of it out in the parking lot. Get on the phone and start gossiping or repeat some dumb story. Storytelling is as bad as gossip. Hey, do you want to hear what happened about the person up the street? That's not only gossip, but what if it was a good thing? Hey, they did this and did this and did this. And then all of a sudden you keep talking about it. Now you're going back into their past and you're bringing up stuff. Come on now. We be men and women of prayer and love God. And when the enemy comes around, he can find nothing in us. It goes on further to say, forgive us our debts. Release me, Lord, of anything that I might have hurt others. I might have caused them to think the wrong thing. Lord, there's a difference between me loving somebody and having to like the way that they're doing things in their life. Help me to still love them beyond their faults, Lord. You know, kind of those kind of things. And then, and do not lead us into temptation. How many know that's a great part? We don't want troubles, do we? Some people teach that, hey, without troubles, you'll never know if you're making it or not. My Bible just tells me to pray that God does not lead you in the wilderness, into troubles. Now, folks, let me ask you something. God doesn't really lead us into troubles, does he? Who does that? No, you do. By listening, not listening to God or listening to the devil. You are correct, but you think about it. You have to make the choice, right? Right. God lays every day choices before us. What choices are we making? And it's important. But if you're a person in prayer, which you are, then these choices are not hard because the flesh part of you is not in the way. It's not getting in the way and fighting with you all the time. Have you ever in your heart wanted to do something, but your head talked you out of it? See, there you go. The flesh, spirit, spirit, flesh. These are contrary. All right, let's move on. And don't leave it, lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We know who that is. I don't want to even hear his voice. I used to be guilty of repeating the things he's trying to do. And that's not good. And so, as a person in prayer, cover these things. Okay, then, then it goes... For yours is the kingdom, kingdom of heaven, and power, dominion, and glory. How long? Amen. So you're on the winning side. There's no defeat here, is there? And uh, I've got the hiccups again, but it says forever. Amen. It's all about you and who you and me about letting God reign and rule in our life. Can you say amen? All right, next, next point is the power of prayer. Prayer is tapping into God's power in the name of Jesus, right? Yeah. Philippians 4, uh, 6 through 7, be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Then, and the peace of God will, uh, excuse me, and the peace of God which surpasses all our understanding will guard your hearts. 
and minds through Christ Jesus. See what prayer does? You're guarded. Your mind doesn't wander away from you. Find it two days later. Who knows? James, I love what this says, 516, confess your trespasses or your offenses and your weaknesses to one another. Doesn't say confess your, your dirty, rotten clothing sin. It says, look, I have a hard time praying, Pastor Kerry. Will you pray with me? See, that's a fault. That's an honesty. I'm really having a hard time really getting, getting right back to some of the disciplines I started in my life. You see, that's being honest. But I really, you know, I'm, I'm watching all this pornography and everything like that. Why don't you really play? That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about being able to be honest about your human flaws. Don't tell everybody your dirty underwear or show them. Can you say amen? Then I like what Romans 12, 10 through 13 says. Be kindly affection one towards another with brotherly love in honoring, giving preference to one another. Not laggering in diligence, but fervent in spirit, boiling, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually steadfast in prayer. See? Continually steadfast in prayer. And that's where the church is missing it. Most of the church only goes to God when they're in trouble. And a lot of the church, they go to a church for entertainment. But they don't go to really seek God. Our pastor says, when you come here, you're going to leave changed. Every day when you come. So if you want to come here eight times a week, you want to come every day seven times a week, you're going to leave changed. See, but people don't come to get changed. Somehow they think they're just going to come, and I'm coming to help. Listen, you're not here just to help. You're here to get healed and fixed. Okay? People don't notice that. And that's why I kind of get a little frustrated when people don't come and hear the word. They're supposed to be here to get fixed. But somehow they're thinking, just going to hang around, we're going to help out once in a while. What, are they dumb? It's totally selfish. No, you're here to get fixed. Jesus' disciples didn't come to help Jesus. They came to get fixed. Then they could help Jesus. Someone say amen. Not lagging in diligence. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 15 through 19. Actually, it's just 16. 16 and 17, 19's in there. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. So we know going in and out of prayer, something kind of disturbs you, pray about it right away. You know, don't be religious. Oh, God. No, Lord, that's kind of, that's a little off. So, Lord, take care of that. Thank you, Lord. And I'm not going to pay my mind to it anymore. Boom. You see? All right. Okay. And it says, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is the will of God. God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about prayer. So by not praying, you're doing what to the spirit? Quenching it. Your flesh will quench it automatically. No matter how good you are in your flesh, how polished and how performing you are in your flesh, it's not worth anything but a sack of manure if you're not doing it for Jesus. Hello, I know that's pretty tough when I mean to say that, but think about it. Those that are in the flesh, Romans 8 says, cannot please God. I didn't say it. It's just the truth. Okay, Luke 18 and we're done. Bless you for letting me go five minutes over. So Then he spoke a parable to them. That men ought always to what? Pray and not to lose heart. It's really easy to lose heart sometimes. You're praying and praying and you don't see anything. You're praying and praying and don't see anything. Let me tell you a little story about me. I'm praying and praying, asking God to change things and everything like that. And I said, Lord, I'm not seeing any changes. He says, how about you? Are you changing? I said, yeah. He says, I got to get you ready for what you're praying. We forget about that. You want to you find a nice woman for your life, but are you marryable? Hello? Oh, God, provide the car. How about the insurance for it? Come on. 
get out of here, get into here. See the difference? All right, I done picked on all of us enough. And, and I'm, preaching, I'm preaching and sharing with me too. Didn't take 46 years of teaching this stuff. Finally, I'm catching hold. All right, so look it. Then he says, um, so there was a certain di a city where a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in the city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God, so it can't be God, nor I regard man, can't be God, Yet because this widow troubles me, and will, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming, she weary me. Amen. Now, I'm going to just tell you right away. The widow shows the least of anybody, because she's tapping into God. Now, the unjust judge is not God. The unjust judge is not the devil, even though he's unjust. The unjust judge is circumstances. Circumstances will never change unless you continually go to God and say, I want them to change. Amen. Then the adversary is dealt with by God. Yeah. And your eyes are off the circumstances and on to the captain of your salvation, the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen. Now, if you got something out of that, tonight. I'm glad you came. Join in the Bible study. Stay tuned for the next one. Bless you. Lord, we pray for them. We strengthen them. Pray for all of us tonight, and we thank you in Jesus' precious name. And we all said...